Please note the following podcast contains adult language and frank discussions of female sexuality. It is suitable only for adult listeners. Electric acid. And I had a client one time that was a um, dominatrix, a very well-known dominatrix. And she had a huge dungeon down here on Jefferson Boulevard in <laughs> Los Angeles. And she had many people working there. And I actually met her because we both had the same personal trainer, right? <laughs> and we just kind of crossed paths. I'm your host, Yvette Lopez. I'm a former Playboy Maxim and FHM model. Currently, I'm a singer, compassionate healer, and an entrepreneur in wellness and fashion. Welcome to our show. Hi, my name is Yvette Lopez, and you're listening to Bodacious Minds, a show that empowers you in every way. Sex, money, relationships, spiritually, emotionally, Sasha, hi. Hey, how are you? How was your week? <laughs> My week was interesting, honey. It just keeps getting, it's different every week. I, I had a really tough week this week. Oh. I think I had a meltdown, to be honest with you. And Why? Um, I just, the quarantine, I didn't think it was bothering me as much because mm. I have so much going on. But what it's really doing for me is putting me into... It's it's like time travel. Like one day I'm five years old, one day I'm 13 years old, and I start to reflect on all of these things in my life. And, Uh you know, I seem to be focused more on all of the things that were not good in my life. And I try my hardest to remember that I'm strong and I can get through this. And it's my past. It doesn't really belong to me anymore but fucking a it's like i can't shake right. this shit off and so our guest has been a huge help for me and i wanted to have him on the show just to share this person and his his knowledge on working with shame and trauma today's guest is brian mahan a somatic experience practitioner He has done amazing work for many people for the past 15 years, and I'd like to introduce him to you, Sasha, and to our listeners. Hi, Brian. How are you? Welcome. Thank you, Sasha. Nice to meet you. Good to see you, Yvette, as always. Hi. Thank (laughs) you. I know. it's. I'm I'm excited that you get to see me in, in my... Hair and makeup. I, yeah, I, never. <laughs> I know. I'm always I, Sasha. I'm always in tears and a ponytail. Oh, <laughs> when I see, which is not a bad thing. Exactly, because you're releasing all that stuff. So, and and crying is the one of the ways that we release those things. And so, Brian, tell us a little bit about the work you do. Well, I am a somatic experiencing practitioner, which is a technique that was developed by Dr. Peter Levine about 35, 40 years ago. Um, It is taught in 25 languages in 125 countries and considered the foremost approach to fully resolving developmental trauma and shock trauma, because we look at trauma through a bit of a different lens than more allopathic Western approaches like traditional talk therapy, et cetera. We look at trauma as initially and perhaps even predominantly being a physiological condition more so than a psychological disorder. And one of the reasons that we look at it that way is that we can become traumatized, preverbal, precognitive, and preconceptual. So if we can be traumatized before we can think and reason, then clearly there's another system at play other than just the neocortex or the higher brain, the thinker part of our brain. And that system is the lower brain, the freeze, flight, fight, fornicate, feed, early detection, warning system, guardian angel uh, part of our brain. And it governs the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is... um, part of how the body self-regulates. So we have a sympathetic nervous system where things go into a sympathetic charge, you know, like emotion or fear, things like that. And then the parasympathetic nervous system comes in to help to manage that. 
And so sometimes in traumatization, there can be incomplete defense responses. There can be overwhelm and underwhelm that the system just isn't able to self-regulate, perhaps because at that time when we have those events, we just don't have the life experience or the support or the resources or the intellect in order to really kind of have a full experience, let that system complete the processes that it knows it needs to. And Brian, is trauma release the the main topic that you help people with? Trauma release? No, I wouldn't say that at all. Well, not that I would say that at all. Um, Mm -hmm. The idea is to help the nervous system return to homeostasis or to a resilient place. Oftentimes, through traumatization, our nervous systems get really disorganized, and it's almost like an electrical charge, you know, it's similar to an electrical, uh, our nervous system. And in an electrical field, we can have short circuits, and we can kind of have the same kind of thing happen in our nervous systems. And so sometimes the system has to learn how to reroute. Um, so we do work with, ultimately, with neuroplasticity at times, but ultimately, If possible, we're trying to assist the nervous system to discharge and reorganize so that it can come back to homeostasis and um, normal full expression. Because, you know, with traumatization, sometimes our banks of toleration become collapsed and we're just kind of living a short and shallow and small existence. We don't have a whole lot of expression. And so as we build the agency and capacity for the nervous systems, banks of toleration to expand, we're also raising our midline as well. And in there, we can have greater expression, feel all of our emotions, and have them be more fluid than getting stuck in them. Mm-hmm. And Brian, mm-hmm. wh- how is it that you got into this yourself? Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I had spent 25 years trying to heal. I had gone to every kahuna and witch doctor and healer I could find. (laughs) I went to every Western approach I could find. And, you know, yeah, I tried it all. I tried it all. And there was some sense of some growth, some healing. Uh, December 21st, 2003, I was heading to see a client of mine and... I was hit by one of two cars that were racing on the freeway, like out of the movie Fast and Furious. One of the witnesses said that she thinks the car was red, but it was going too fast to tell for sure. Oh, my God. And my car flipped end over end, rolled three times across three Mm -hmm. lanes of traffic, slid on the driver's door 150 feet and crashed into a concrete wall. And I walked away from it. Um, and then after the wreck and how discombobulating that whole experience was, um, I don't even know the time frame. But, you know, sometime later, I started having panic attacks. But, mm-hmm. of course, I didn't know there were panic attacks at the time. Mm-hmm. I just thought I was going crazy or I had become possessed. So I sought out help and I asked. Uh, I went to my, my first point in health at the time, Dr. Connie, and I asked her for a referral for an exorcist. Mm-hmm. And she kind of looked at me and tilted her head. She was like, honey, what's going on? (laughs) (laughs) You know, and so I I told her what was happening. And she said, oh, honey, I don't think you need an exorcist. You know, I I think you need a trauma specialist. And so she sent me to a somatic experiencing practitioner. And in three sessions, my panic attack stopped. That's awesome. Within two weeks of that third session, I entered the training. I was like, I don't know what voodoo this is, but... I want to study this. I want to figure out what this is. And I want to help other people. And so Mm -hmm. I never thought in a million years I'd be where I am doing what I'm doing. Um, But man, I I, love my work. I have a question. It's, is, you know, we're raised all in different ways, obviously, but we're raised to don't speak, don't sit, don't touch, don't cry, don't, uh, you know, do you think, all of this stuff comes from that like we're we're trained to basically not fucking feel and not be ourselves we're trained to be what our parents want to quote unquote want us to be and because i know growing up 
I grew up in a beauty salon. My grandmother owned a beauty salon. Always getting my hair done. Always Mine dressed too. up like a fucking doll. I know, I know. You and I have that in common. You and I would get our hair done at the same time. Um, you know, and I watched my grandmother be dolled up. And Lord forbid, you know, when we went, when I went away uh, to my uncle's, I could get dirty and play in the dirt and stuff. But I was raised, you know, when I would cry, look at people are looking at you. They're staring at you to embarrass me. So now, mm. Lord forbid, I get it in like the slightest like argument or anything like that in, in public. I freak out. Like my husband can't approach me about anything in public. I, I'm like, it sends me into shock. I like freeze and can't talk and I'm embarrassed. Isn't Is it this, funny how that old stuff still stays with us? It's like through, throughout up. the years, it, isn't it? It's it's surreal. Our parents plus, were wrong. <laughs> plus, as Latinos, we're very concerned about what people are going to say. In Spanish, we have a saying, el que dirán, which means what people will say. It's like a term mm -hmm. because it's that concern about what other people are going to think. And I feel like with all humans, that's the case. But in certain cultures, for example, like in a lot of Asian culture, it's all about making sure you save a face and making sure that you don't embarrass yourself or your, your, your family. I think, Absolutely. you know, that, yeah, Brian, what is your take on all that? Well, I think all what this. we're talking about is the universal experience of shame. Yeah. Because shame is used in every culture since the beginning of time to socialize children, to protect the tribe, which can be the family itself or the larger community, and to establish power and higher and to maintain hierarchy. And so the interesting thing is, is that we can feel shame before we have cognition, right? And so it's actually a physiological survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. Because as children, we must remain in favor. Mm -hmm. We must maintain yeah. those relational bridges, even with the people who are shaming us, mm -hmm. right? And when we're being shamed, the terror that we feel inside is the terror of abandonment, neglect, being shunned, or being mm -hmm. cast out. Mm -hmm. And what that means to a child on an instinctual level is survival because yeah. human animals are 100% dependent upon others for their care and survival for about 25% of their lives. Unless you're a millennial, then it's about 30 to 40% of your life. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but mm -hmm. We have to recognize and acknowledge that there's this instinctual behavioral component. And so, you know, when we're feeling shame, the first thing that happens is our brains get scrambled, right? We can't think clearly. Then we break social engagement. So we look down and away. Our larynx constricts to stop us from saying whatever we were saying. And our bodies become immobilized to stop us from doing whatever we were doing. And that immobilization can occur through bracing or through collapse. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. And so that reaction, when habituated over time, becomes a part of the expression of can become a part of the expression of who we are. And when we're in that shame response or in those shaming experiences, we form beliefs. We form beliefs about ourself. There must be something wrong with me for my mom to be treating me that way. Mm -hmm. We form beliefs about our shamers or, our, you know, the, whoever, you know, the perpetrator is, as it were. Uh, we mm -hmm. form beliefs around the environment, around the situation. And we also bring on survival strategies and coping mechanisms and defense structures that are indicative of where we are in our lives at that time, our intellect, our life experience, et cetera. So some of these reactions are actually quite, quote unquote, immature, mm -hmm. and yet they remain stable throughout our lives. So developmental trauma, which shame is the kingpin of, uh, developmental trauma can impact and affect us for the rest of our lives as these beliefs that we form will remain in place no matter how many affirmations we repeat. If they're in conflict with our embodied beliefs, mm -hmm. the beliefs are going to win. Mm -hmm. Brian, Brian, I totally understand what you're saying because, you know, I, I hypnotize people as well as do life coaching. And one of the things that I have explained to people is that 
a lot of times, you know, our minds learn these patterns. And once your mind has a pattern, your mind keeps wanting to repeat the same thing over and over and over again. And it knows it so instinctively that you don't even have to try to bring that up, to conjure that up. It just happens. Your body is a part of that equation. Mm, we feel yeah. everything that we think. And yeah. we think about everything that we feel. And so we can be in cognitive dissonance when we have a new intellectual conviction that is in conflict with an embodied belief. And so until that physiological piece is also addressed, then the full and complete transformation may not be possible. Yeah. And so, you know, that's where the body-mind connection really you know, it, it's, it's so valuable and important to recognize and acknowledge that there's a body-mind connection because yeah. in our culture these days, we have a tendency to think that all we need to do is, you know, increase our intellect and that's what we need for our survival. If I can anticipate mm -hmm. problems before they become problems and I can think my way around them or through them or out of them or, or a way to avoid them, that, you know, I'm more likely to survive. That way of thinking and, actually causes more anxiety than anything. When you're, when you're in that forward thinking, there's oftentimes the explicit memory or imagination, sorry, that, you know, imagination that is coupled with that. And so now we're imagining the future. We're thinking about all, you know, thinking about all these problems, imagining them as if they're real. And yeah. the lower brain doesn't know the difference between perception and reality. And the That's lower right. brain governs how we feel. And so you know, when we're imagining the future, we're having the experience now that we're wanting to avoid then. Mm -hmm. and In many ways, we're making it a reality. Exactly, yeah. yeah. When it doesn't and, even fucking exist, so we're causing yeah. more problems for ourselves. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and we don't even know what, if it's going to happen that way. But just what, that's what happens in a, a lot of my, why I have my sessions I was feeling such fear of things that weren't even happening or were going to happen. And I didn't know that the upper brain and the lower brain do separate things. I had no clue. Right. You know, and, and to kind of circle this back to this whole shame experience, right, is, we, you know, all of those shaming voices, all of those messages that we're getting when we're young, we come into the world and we're getting all of this message all these messages from the outside world. And this part of you is unacceptable. This part of you is wrong. That behavior is bad, right? And in order to protect ourselves, we take on those voices and we create this part within us that becomes the inner critic. So it's a self-protective mechanism initially, but it then becomes almost part of our personality because so much of how we see ourselves and the world and our relationship to others in the world is based in shame. And it's Brian, based what in you're the saying, sense there's something wrong with me. Brian, mm -hmm. what you're saying makes so much sense to me because at a young age, we're already being hypnotized. And so we're not born with all of these notions, but with enough time and everything that's around us, whether it be media, family, teachers, in the end, that we get all of these unfortunate conceptions and then they become a part of our way of thinking, feeling, and behaving. I just want to get into this before we go into something yeah, else. Go for it. Yeah, I feel that, you know, relationships, friendships and relationships, you know, with your partner, I feel that that has totally taken over everyone. Like, we become something we, every time I was in a relationship, I had to become something different to be in that relationship. And I had become so many vets, I didn't even know who the fuck I was. And I'm just now learning to like myself, love myself, who I am, what I like. Didn't even know I had, I, you know, I like to have hobbies because again, in every relationship, I just morphed into what they wanted me to be is do you Brian do you think that comes from having to morph into what your parents want you to be absolutely absolutely because we're getting these messages like you know I grew up in a wealthy family and my parents didn't come from wealth 
And so they found themselves in this echelon of society that they wanted to fit in and they wanted to belong and they wanted to raise us as if we were fifth generation, blue blooded, well healed, you know, um, well behaved <laughs> Southern gentlemen, right? But they didn't really have a clear idea of what that was. And so what they did is they course corrected my every thought, word, and action oh, into God. what they thought other people in that mm. society would embrace. So I've had to dismember all these parts of me that I'd come to learn weren't acceptable, weren't good, weren't right, weren't the best. But what happened was, is that I came to learn from that experience that there wasn't anything good about me. Hmm. There wasn't anything I could say properly, perfectly with the right vocabulary, enunciation, pronunciation, et cetera, right? Because everything was so micromanaged. Mm -hmm. And so what I learned was that I needed to be still and quiet. That was how I figured out I could be liked and embraced was if I could become a chameleon. If I could, you know, because there wasn't anything good about me. So let me be like whoever I'm in front of. And maybe they'll like me because I'm more similar to them. But the problem was, is that when I was in a group, I had to become invisible. Mm -hmm, because I couldn't mm -hmm. do that. Right. And yes, so all of this stuff becomes part of our personality, becomes part of, you know, how we behave in the world. And there's the constant internal conflict and all those self-loathing voices and self-corrections that occur within because we're trying to self-preservate. We're trying to ensure that we'll be liked. And so we want to be able to, you know, shift out of these internalized beliefs that there's something wrong with me and I'm bad and I'm unfixable into healthy shame where we have discernment. I can bring these parts of me forward in this group and I can hold these parts back. And when I go over to that group, I can bring forward other parts and hold other parts back. And so we get to have an authentic expression of ourselves when we can embrace all of who we are, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. So that said, I'm thinking in particular about a client of mine who came to me originally following a diagnosis of being borderline Asperger's. And when I first opened the door, she could not look at me in the eyes. I extended my hand to greet her. She couldn't, you know, shake my hand. I brought her into my office. We sat down and there was, you know, there was just, there was a, a, a discomfort and difficulty in that relational connection. And so hence that kind of normal diagnosis of Asperger's, right? Having that social inability to read other people's emotions and, and have an emotional expression in oneself and therefore it makes it difficult to socially connect. Well, what happened over time is I discovered that there was an event that had happened 12 years prior where she said that she had been in an automobile accident. And so what had happened was she was going on, in, on the freeway. It was dark. There was a, an accident that had already occurred. Police were on the scene. And my client struck and killed one of the police officers. Oh, God. Then that became a big story in L.A. News. And there was the parade and the procession and all of that and honoring this fallen police officer. And so the this, this shame that she felt for killing someone, the shame that she felt for this public humiliation of her being the reason why this person was no longer here. Mm. But as we continue to unpack it, I helped her see that the police had not secured the crime scene. There were no flares out. There were no lights going on any of the cars. The area yeah. was dark. The officers didn't have reflective clothing. The officer had his back to oncoming tra traffic. And even at the scene of the accident, the other police officers ensured her that she was not at fault. It was not her fault at all. But what she did, because of the shame that she felt, is she put herself in a 12-year self-imprisonment. Mm. So she had this deep, dark, horrible secret that made her so different and other mm -hmm. from other people that it was nearly impossible for her to socially engage and connect. And now 
she's in her first relationship. They just celebrated yeah. a year anniversary, Aww. even in the time of COVID, job promotion, book deal, all kinds of stuff um, happening mm. has come alive. So it wasn't Asperger's, it was shame. But Asperger's is real and it exists and it's just something different than what she had. She had, right? yeah. Where did you get your schooling for this? Um, well, the training itself is through the Somatic Experiencing Training Institute. Like I said, it's taught in 125 countries and 25 languages. Um, but I've also, five years, been training and assisting the Center for Healing Shame. And mm -hmm. I'm now the first person who will be teaching this technique that was developed by the couple that co-created the Center for Healing Shame Wonderful. and co-created the Lion Rubin Method for Healing Shame. So, you know, those have been my two main places where I've learned, but I've been a seeker and a searcher and a self-educating and all that kind of thing throughout, throughout my life. Well, I have a big surprise for Brian and we have a mystery guest Right and on. she has been on our show before, and I just thought it'd be so lovely to have you guys together. And I don't want to give it away, but we have Sefi Haven on the show. Oh, my gosh. Okay. There she is. Hi, beautiful. <laughs> hey, Sefi. Oh, my gosh. It's so good to Welcome see your back. face. Hi, thank you. You guys all look so good. <laughs> thank you. How long has it been since you guys seen each other? Pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, yeah. yeah. What is that? The last, time, the, the last time we got together, we uh, had dinner, and it was, to, you know, Stephanie's writing a, a series of books, and there are some memoirs, and I'm kind of coming into the into the second book. Um, I enter into the scene, and <laughs> so we got together to, to kind of talk story, and, you know, and it was shocking how differently we remembered the same... <laughs> events and experiences, you know? But then again, it was the 80s in New York. So Shut um, up. Yeah, don't shut up. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't. You guys, it, was the, it was just, so it was just you, last year. It was just last how year. Did, how did you guys... So how did you guys meet, first of all? Because Sefi and I have already gotten acquainted. We both were escorts at different times. And it has bonded us, let me tell you. And I just kind of want to get to know, I want to hear how you guys know each other and how everything fits into each other's lives. You being a somatic therapist, were you one when you guys met? And you also being an escort, were you one before you guys met? Uh, Brian, you want to tell how we met? We, met in, <laughs> <laughs> we actually met in an acting class. No. Oh. And um, I went in to audit the acting class, and there was this beautiful redhead who did a kind of an improv scene on stage. And then lo and behold, at the end of class, I was assigned a scene with her. And ah. so that's how we met, is we had the scene to rehearse and, and perform. Was this in New and, York uh, or Los Angeles? In New, New York, New York City. Yeah. In New York City. Yeah, I yeah. thought he was so sexy and so <laughs> handsome he was, and tall and blonde and funny and we got along really good and he wore like rings on different parts of his fingers and his thumbs and i was like oh god he's Still so do. sexy <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> that looks like not, fun. yeah but he he and i became really good friends so when i became an escort i was living in a house kitchen which was terrible and lonely and so, you know, you sit in the apartment and you wait for your call from the agency. Instead, I would head over to Brian's apartment. He lived on 23rd in Chelsea and hang out at his apartment and we'd eat Malamars. Well, he would eat Malamars because I didn't want to take my clothes off and have a Malamar belly. Um, <laughs> I, I, called them, I, I called them moon pies because I'm from the South. <laughs> That's right, moon pies. <laughs> and uh, he would make dinner and we'd watch, you know, movies on the TV the television. And uh, yeah, and the, one, one of my first important calls was when I was with Brian. The guy wanted somebody with star quality, and I was too scared to go out the door. I was like, oh, he's, he's going to hate me. Oh, I don't have no star quality. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> so Brian was really kind of like a, a best friend and, and really one of the only people that knew that I was working. So one of the only mm. people I could confide in. He gave me one session one time. It was pretty amazing. So I was st starting stand-up, and I was terrified. 
And I had huge stage fright after all those years of not being on stage. So Brian uh, said, come over, doll. And I came over. And you see, he kind of went, took me through like, a, what was it, Brian? Like a hypnotic thing or just a talk Well, I don't really or... like to think of it as hypnosis in any, any way. Um, we worked on helping to lower the affect of all of her anxiety and nerves. And then, you know, it gave you some tools and techniques that you could kind of apply yourself before going on stage. And and then, of course, I was there. Yes, that was um... the best thing. He, not only was he was there, he brought like this whole contingent of people, which were, and they were great. They were big yeah. laughers. <laughs> Was super. But then years later, I used those techniques. Like when I was going into like having really stressful moments, having panic attacks, I kind of remembered what he said and really it helped, you know. Well, yeah. Brian, everyone I, needs I a Brian. <laughs> How did you guys both end up in Los Angeles from New York and was it kind of at the same time? I don't know oh, about okay, the well, timing. I came out yeah, to finish up a film and then... Um, you know, was I was like, uh, I got to go to L.A., Hollywood, you know, because I was a New York actor. Right. And then, you know, I kind of like got off the plane and I was like, wow, sun and sky. And, <laughs> you know, and then I had to go back to New York. And then I came out one time to um, screen test because it was down to me and Richard Greco to replace Johnny Depp on 21 Jump Street. No oh, shit. <laughs> and that was a moment where my shame lost the job for me. Um, mm. So, you know, I went in, uh, you know, everybody loved me, blah, blah, blah. I was the first pick over Richard Greco. And then I just blew it. I just blew it in the interview because my shame took over and I collapsed and mm. I said stupid things and I, you know, and they were like, well, we certainly can't trust this guy to headline a show. <laughs> and so. <laughs> But um, yeah, so Steffi kind of was kind of bi coastal for a while, I think. Um, it was, yeah. <laughs> well, so you were in Juilliard, correct, when you guys met? No, I had already graduated and I went back into acting classes because I didn't want to lose the thing, you know. Keep, yeah. keep, your, keep your wheels oiled. And, uh, yeah. and that was just before I started uh, as an escort. I was still like doing all these crazy jobs where I wasn't very good at them and it was hardly any money. And then I kind of crossed that line into escorting and Brian was the only person I could confide in. So, and yeah, Brian, you, you know, obviously working through shame and stuff, did you ever feel like it was something that you needed to be in her life for, or you just kept it basically that was your friend and supported her in whatever she did? Or did you feel the need to be a therapist at that time? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I never thought in a million years I'd be doing what I'm doing. The idea never <laughs> came to me, never crossed my mind. It happened as a result of my car wreck, as a result of those first three sessions I had myself. You know, I mean, I went from having seven to 10 full-blown panic attacks every single day, all day long. You know, I was laying in the living room floor in the fetal position, howling at the moon with the curtains drawn and the phones off. I didn't want anybody to know what was happening because I didn't want to get 5150. I didn't want to get locked up, you know? <laughs> and so I was terrified to tell anybody. Um, so, and then I went to Dr. Connie. She sent me to the somatic experiencing practitioner, three sessions. My panic attack stopped. I haven't had one in 16 years. Going on 17. Lucky. Right. And then immediately just went into the training. And I didn't necessarily even think at the time that that was going to be a career change for me, but it was just continued to be so transformational. It's a three year training program. And so I continued having sessions throughout that time and then doing the training. And then I started helping friends. And then it just kept, you know, going blossoming. From there. And now I have an international private practice and I see 95% of my clients on Zoom or Skype or video. And I have for 15 years, I've been seeing clients all over the world via yeah. video. And so. it doesn't That's change wonderful. your friendships with the work that you do. You feel comfortable with like, how, you know, some people can say like, oh, I can't be a part of that because I feel like when people do that, they're hiding something. Well, I've always been that chameleon. And so I'm able to connect and resonate with all kinds of people. And that certainly has been developed and honed over the last 16 years in working with trauma and working with shame. You know, and part of working with shame is I can't be in that hierarchical position. Mm -hmm. I need to be, I need to join my clients. And that's why I use a lot of self-disclosure because I want my clients to know, you know, we're in this together and 
you know, we're we're equals. There's there's no yeah. difference here because shame exists anywhere. There's a feeling of difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And that's one of the things that I've always loved about Steffi is her heart and her focus and her mind has been as a healer. She I has, love that. She's done what she's done in a transformative way for herself and for her clients. She is a healer. And I had a client one time that was a um, dominatrix, a very well-known dominatrix. And she had a huge dungeon down here on Jefferson Boulevard in Los <laughs> Angeles. And she had many people working there. And I actually met her because we both had the same personal trainer, right? (laughs) And we just kind of crossed paths, you know, when, you know, she'd be finishing up and I'd be coming in and we'd struck a friendship. And then I discovered who she was. She shared with me and blah, 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 blah. And so I was hanging out with her chatting one day and she told me, you know, because I was really curious about the whole idea of the dungeon and all the different rooms and all the different role playing and all the kind of stuff that, you know, people are seeking out. And she said the one thing she will not allow in her facility is verbal. (laughs) Anything else can go but verbal because words hurt and damage and that wound is harder to heal Mm -hmm. than any kind of physical wound. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was tremendous because she too thought of her work as being a healer and help facilitate people through things that they were dealing with and working through. And she would not do anything or allow anyone in her employ to harm someone in a way that might be irrevocable. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a client who told me that he would have taken his own life if he hadn't had me in his life. And it took me a while to understand, but all you know, Sefi, the, the the stories that we we hear from the people that we sleep with. I've been with married couples. I've been with women. I've been with men, and usually it's a conversation first, and it's usually about hmm. why they're there, and they're sad, and they're lonely, and they're depressed, and they're self conscious. And you know, even if I had like a, an overweight lover, to me they were the most beautiful things. You know, they were the sweetest and the kindest, and. So I found it was, I was like, well, maybe I'm on this earth just to make people happy because I seem to please people, make people happy. It's the part with myself that I have, but I know it comes from childhood stuff. But I think, you know, I'm glad to hear you speak about this because I'm more comfortable when people can be open with me because then it allows me to feel like myself because my mind is very, very free. And because, Steffi, we were talking about how we were raised and don't say this, don't do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. So you're raised to believe you can't fucking basically do a goddamn thing. So, you know, I love hearing Brian say those beautiful things about sex work. And because that's how it it should, you know, I I mean, I just threw away. I have to one day we're going to do show and tell, guys, and I'm going to show you my sex tour. And my husband um, bought ropes and we hired somebody to teach us how to tie each other up. It was the most erotic thing because they they made it into a dress, but it went between your legs. And when you move, it like rubs. Oh, it's so sexy. You know what we've <laughs> used the fucking ropes for? We've never used them alone. We use them to tie the doors shut so the dogs can't come in. Uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's yeah. funny. So I need more. I need more of this sex talk with you guys. <laughs> How about you, Seth? What's your favorite type of porn? You know, it's so funny. I... I never watched much porn, but that was mostly because I was working so much. So I was kind of living <laughs> in this kind of thing. And I was like, oh, you know, I, when I, I was done, time. it was like, I just want to watch Judge Judy and eat a hamburger, you know. <laughs> so, but when but this is how I I came to porn was I had clients who liked porn and we would it would extend the time because they would bring these VHS tapes Oh my God, you know, so old, <laughs> but these VHS yeah, right. tapes and we pop them in and watch whatever kind they liked. What I noticed though, back when it went from VHS tapes or, you know, you had to go to those movie houses where P.B. Herman got lost his career or whatever, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that men nowadays, because it's so available and on their phones, I notice nowadays that men have a lot harder time getting hard, staying hard, you know, and I'll... <laughs> I kind of say, 
have you watched a lot of porn? Because there's a lot of, <laughs> do you know what I mean? A lot of expectation of what they have. Now they have these images in their minds or a certain way of doing it, you know. Um, I don't know. I think it kind of distorts things just a little bit about what people are. Sp- or one time a man actually slapped my breasts and I was like, hey, Ooh, what you, ouch. I am not, I am not in a porno. Because, you know, in pornos they get, like now they're kind of like, slapping the women's breasts and they're and they're like ah you like it don't you and she's like oh yeah i love it you know <laughs> no <laughs> not just... at all <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, yeah no it's way. really weird <laughs> or they'll you know i don't know if you so one guy had this porn in and it was um this girl sweet you know whatever and the guys are always such ugly like you know 1970s mustaches and hair yeah. coming out everywhere and they're like you know they spit on their hand and they spit on the girl. And so when guys in real life now get, have such accessible porn, I can always tell because they're like spit. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no spitting. No, no, because <laughs> this is actually delicate and it go, it's an innie. You know, your thing goes innie. That's why. So it's got to be clean. You can't just spit, you know. <laughs> Ew, a big and, but, Yeah, you don't have it much. But when you do, like, you know, like the guy's been watching a little too much porn. I haven't had that in a very long time, but. I do remember when it was, you know. I love, I love that you know when somebody's watched so much porn. Well, you guys, we have to wrap things up, but I appreciate all of you guys being on here with us. And, you know, it was so Thank fun you. to have both of you on here. And I'd love it's... to have more conversation with Sefi. And you, I have questions for Sefi and Brian. And we can do this again another time. But anything else you guys want to add to this or... Give your words of wisdom to our listeners, Brian. Well, I don't know about words of wisdom to, to the listeners as much as what I would love to say is just how proud I am of you. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. to hmm. see you stepping into your own embodiment and your own empowerment. And, I'm going to cry. <laughs> and moving <laughs> forward, right, even in the face of fear and pain and challenges, right? Because that's an act of courage. And so I just want to acknowledge your courage and your big old bodacious heart um, (laughs) because of what you're doing here and wanting to help your listeners gain a better understanding of how everyone gets to be who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, I have an expression and this is what I'll say to the listeners. You be you, boo. You be you. (laughs) Just be you. All of you. You may find that there are certain places where you hold a little bit of you back because of the circumstance or the relationships that, you know, are there in the field. But then that doesn't mean you have to hold that part back everywhere. You'll Mm -hmm. find other places and other people where you can express those parts of yourself, too. Mm -hmm. And that's the superhero power of discernment. Love that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Sefi, for taking the time to come in and share your time with us. And I wanted to see you guys together. (laughs) Thank you for inviting me. It's great to see you. You look beautiful, Sasha. You look great. Thanks for joining us, guys. Yeah, Yeah, great seeing you. you again. Pleasure meeting you, Sasha. And so good to see you, my love. Pleasure meeting you as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right, right, kiddos. All right, guys. Bye for now. Bye. On the next episode of Bodacious Minds, join me and my guest host, Stephanie Bakwan, as we talk with Darlene Bernala, who, along with her twin sister, was named Playboy Playmate of the Millennium. She shares with us how she overcame abuse to lead a radiant life as a mother, writer, and activist. Thanks for listening, and thank you to my guest co-host Sasha Carion and our guests Brian Mahan and Sefi Haven. Bodacious Minds is a production of Electrocast Media. Our executive producers are Mark Netter and Peter Rafelson. Our editor is Antoine Bledsoe. I'm your host and producer Yvette Lopez.